Stanford University. What an exciting ride it has been. So, uh, some, before we tackle the limits of deep learning for natural language processing, some organizational things. Uh, I know uh, some nerves are uh, down to the wire. So, we want to say first uh, and, and foremost, uh, sorry for some of the craziness around PA4. It's a very large class. Uh, it's a very useful class for a lot of your guys' career and girls. Um, so, like, it will be useful even if you might get, you know, a point here less, uh, here and there less. It's a very useful class because it is so cutting edge with that cutting edge kind of research vibe and new models and the class size and excitement it is very hard to make everything perfect uh, the first time. So thanks a lot for all your feedback on the situation of PA4. There's a lot of internal discussion in the, the TA staff and between Chris and me, and uh, we're trying to make it as fair uh, as, as possible and, and help you get off the ground. So uh, the main thing uh, that is kind of, I think, straightforward and everybody's happy about it is that we'll give you a short 33-hour extension. Uh, for assignment four as well as the final project. So the new deadline uh, that does not use any late days is 9 a.m. on Sunday. That's this upcoming Sunday. Uh, and then the hard deadline that sadly we cannot push any further because we'll have to actually grade uh, the almost 700 students' projects um, is 9 a.m. on Wednesday. We have to submit uh, the grades just a few days later uh, to let people graduate and all that. So. That is the hard deadline, there's no extension, yes. How do you submit it? The submission instructions should be on, on the... Ideally, if you do PA4, you submit to Coda Lab to, to get the sort of official number not as well. Ideally. You must, yeah, not ideally, <laughs> totally required. It looks like there are some, there, there are at least a, do, a dozen or two groups who, you know, for whom it would be ideal and they, hopefully they'll get something. Um, so we'll, we'll go a little bit into how to help uh, those folks. Um, all right, then don't forget the poster session. It is now actually just slightly before that final deadline. Uh, but really at the poster session, we want to be able to get a sense of what your project is about. Uh, really the last nine hours uh, or so that you have of mental time between the poster session and the very final deadline, you should just be spending on writing a nice report, adding nicer looking plots and things like that, uh, and maybe finishing that last cross-validation experiment to tweak your performance by like one or two percent. Um, so we, we expect uh, not too many excuses at the poster session saying, oh, this is just a poster, but in nine hours it will be much, much better and different. <laughs> really it will be looking at that poster um, sort of as your main project output. Uh, so the session itself is 5% of your grade, the final PA4 and, uh, and final project are 27% of your grade. Uh, uh, any questions around uh, the poster session? Organizational things? All right, so uh, another, another update. Um, I'll, I'll get back to the poster session a bit, um, but uh, another update on uh, PA4. First we thought, okay, there's a couple of groups that are really struggling hard. We'll give them uh, some more helper code. It's not really starter code at this point anymore. It's just like helping you out. Uh, even the modifications of the starter code were just pretty minor. Um, but uh, then there's a huge backlash of all the students who did put in all the work to get to that baseline model uh, themselves. And that backlash seemed to be larger than the excitement by the students uh, and so again, we're trying to balance things out a lot. Uh, in general, I hope you appreciate the hard work that all the TAs are doing. Um, when, back when I was an undergrad in Germany, like people were just like, you're 10 minutes late with your assignment submission, you get zero out of your assignment. You can't make the final project or the final deadline for the, uh, the midterm or something, you just take the class next year. So hopefully, <laughs> We're, we're making everybody a lot happier uh, than, than those times. Um, and we're trying really to, to be really fair. Um, so with that said, we'll give you some starter pseudocode. Uh, that is sort of our way of trying to make the two bounds the least unhappy. Um, really the starter pseudocode is super simple. I've given it to a couple of people who are struggling with, with QA uh, and he came to my office hour already before. But it's uh, something that 
you should all be able to implement fairly quickly at this point. Um, and so I'll walk you through a little bit. This starter code implemented properly and you know, tuned well, the right hyperparameters and so on, should get you at least above 50% uh, F1. And the code is essentially, you just pipe your question through an LSTM, you get the final hidden state of a question queue, you pipe your input through an LSTM, you get an output at each hidden state, uh, let's call it XI at each word in the input, and then you just take a neural network to classify with an input, the in two inputs are the question vector, the final hidden state, and each hidden state at a certain time step, XI, and then you predict the start token, and you can either use the same or probably a different one uh, to predict the end token for each question. So something as simple as that should get you something like 50% F1 score. And then on top of that, you can do all the bells and whistles that the TAs uh, have talked about before. You can uh, take uh, all the elements of the hidden states of the LSTM and you do an inner product uh, with the inputs and you compute this co-attention or context matrix and lots of other extensions. But really, we hope that this is something that's possible for everybody, but the groups who have already put in all the work, that just should not be a big surprise. Uh, and you know, they may have some version of these and probably more ex advanced versions than that uh, already. All right, any, any questions? about the starter code, the project. Um, so I guess the question is, uh, any advice on should we uh, stick to what we have or uh, use this kind of simple baseline? I guess it depends on where you are at uh, with your F1. If you're much above that, then you probably don't have to get back to this. And you probably, in your current model, capture something of that sort. Uh, in general, these first two steps are good steps for pretty much every model. So if you haven't done that, uh, just throw that in there. Um, these, you probably have done something more advanced by now, and if you get um, that, then that's fine. Sometimes there's always a fine balance, and you might be really annoyed with how hard this is, but this is really also what we would like you to teach and learn about the field. It's, sometimes it's frustrating, and sometimes you're really stuck, and then learning exactly how to deal with this is actually a super valuable skill, both for academic research as well as industrial research. Uh, sometimes it's very hard to set up your problem and know where to get started uh, from. and so. Uh, as, you, as you put these together, sometimes you'll have a trade-off. You can tune a baseline more and get higher, or you have a not well-tuned baseline and add some more complex model variants to that baseline and also get better. And so it's, it's always a fine balance. I think uh, the default is just make sure you have a baseline that's set up that's correct. And that kind of simple baseline should get you at least 50%. Um, really, if you tune that uh, a lot with lots of crazy, interesting dropout over recurrent nets and so on, you could get up to 60% F1 with this kind of simple model. Now, you don't need to tune it to death. Sometimes you basically get sort of diminishing uh, returns, right? You tune it a little bit, you get a couple percent improvements, and then the last couple of improvements of the baseline might be harder and harder, and it might be faster for you to just implement a slightly more sophisticated model. And that's, that's true for generally all sort of deep learning NLP systems. Great question. All right. Now, uh, one last note on the poster session before we get onto the last limits. Uh, some of those limits actually include question answering, so we will talk about the dynamic co-attention network, which some of you may know now. Um, but uh, again, everybody's uh, expected to attend the poster session. Um, if you cannot attend, you have to submit a small video and ask for an exception, especially as CPD students. Uh, ideally, we hope that during, everybody is in sort of two blocks. Uh, we hope that in the block that you're not assigned, you can actually walk around and see other students' projects. I can uh, guarantee you that there are some really exciting and interesting projects out there. Uh, and it'll be just, I think, fun to, to talk to students, even if you're a little sleep deprived, which you may be just before. Um, I'm sure I was in most of mine. Um, you will have very nice lunch, lots of food, um, and uh, because it's public, uh, there's a lot of excitement around this. Uh, that's kind of what I meant too, of like, yes, it's much 
harder this class and especially this PA4, but it's also a lot more useful than a lot of other classes. Uh, I personally know many dozens of people who took similar versions of this class before and they got job offers just because of that class and what they've done in their projects in this class. So there will be lots of companies and representatives from those companies. There will be VCs and who knows, you might even get some seed funding just because you have an awesome project. So it's hopefully that that will make you less, uh, less upset about the, the struggle uh, of the last week um, for this project. All right, any last questions about the poster session? All right, so let's, uh, let's talk about the limits of single task learning and in general deep learning for, for natural language processing. I think so far the field of deep learning and NLP has gotten very good at taking a single data set task and model and metric and then optimizing that setting. That's kind of what we've also gone through a lot of examples uh, in this class. And thanks to these end-to-end uh, trainable deep learning models, the speed of these improvements has also gotten better and better over time, which is really exciting to see, especially if you've sort of followed the field uh, for, for a long time. However, if we continue to start all these projects from random parameters, uh, which we mostly do, except maybe the word vectors. Word vectors are great sort of to pre-train a lot of your models. Uh, we won't ever obtain a single natural language understanding system that we can just kind of converse with uh, and one that understands language in uh, all of its complexity. And so I personally don't think that a single unsupervised task can fix that either. In fact, you'll hear some people talk about this and this is uh, certainly a point of contention, like can we have a single unsupervised task and just solve that really well and then get to some kind of better AI systems? I don't think NLP uh, will will fall into that category because largely uh, language has actually a lot of supervision and different kinds of feedback and requires you in the end to solve a lot of different tasks, right? In, in language, if you wanna have a proper uh, language system, you may have to do some sentiment understanding of you know, what you're getting given as input. But sometimes you also have to logically reason over certain kinds of facts. And other times you have to retrieve some different facts from a database or maybe logically reason over uh, facts in a database and do some memory retrieval. And yet again, other times you have to ground uh, whatever you're talking about in the visual or physical world. And so on. so there are a lot of different kinds of components. And if we want to have a system that understands language better and better, ideally that system can incorporate lots of different things. And so in a more uh, scientific way, in the way we kind of described in a lot of tasks, we have different kinds of frameworks uh, you know, for sequence tagging, sentence level kinds of classification, or two sentence kinds of classification, like understanding entailment, uh, logical entailment and things like that. And we have a lot of different kinds of sequence to sequence models. And so, as I mentioned uh, a couple of uh, slides ago, we have a bunch of obstacles to get towards such a system. And here's uh, just a couple of uh, very recent papers, uh, several of which I've been involved with, so I'm very excited about them. Uh, and then some also, uh, one from Google, um, where basically we're trying to tackle that limit, the limits uh, that we have in natural language processing, especially deep, deep NLP. The first one is one that we actually already talked about, which is we didn't have a single architecture, let alone a single model. Again, the architecture might have different hyperparameters, different weights uh, for the different tasks that you work on. And we already basically uh, talked about this dynamic memory network, uh, which could also be used for question answering in some form of that you might even be able to use for question answering. But we already talked about that, so I want to talk about uh, the next obstacle, uh, which we didn't get to last time, and that is to actually jointly learn many tasks in a single model. Now, fully joint multitask learning is really, really hard. What do I mean by this? So basically, so far, when people talk about multitask learning or many task learning, uh, they assume there's a source task and then there's a target task. And they just kind of hope that the pre-training your neural network on the source task will improve another target task. Uh, but in my case, I'd ideally have both of them be trained jointly. So instead of having uh, separate decoders, for instance, for different uh, languages or different classification problems, ideally we have just a single set of, a uh, very large set of different classes we might want to predict 
about a, uh, about a certain input, uh, text input. And really have the exact same decoder. So if we have a sequence to sequence model uh, and we have a question about each sequence, ideally the sequence decoder can just output different kinds of answers depending on what the question was about that input. Now, when people uh, do multitask learning, in many cases they also just uh, share lower layers and train those jointly, but not these higher layers. So what I mean by this in natural language processing, mostly we're sharing just the word vectors. Uh, we don't share other higher LSTM layers, for instance, across a whole host of different tasks. Uh, in computer vision, it's actually a little further ahead in that respect, in that uh, a pre-trained CNN uh, on a very large data set like ImageNet can actually be used for a lot of other tasks pretty well. You just change the top layer of a deep uh, convolutional neural network in computer vision and you can still get pretty good accuracy and transfer a lot of the learnings from different visual tasks. Uh, we still can't really do that uh, very convincingly in NLP. And in many cases, you'll only read about uh, multitask learning in the cases where the tasks were somewhat related and hence helped each other. So we know, for instance, part of speech tagging helps parsing because the parser makes decisions and if it knows a certain word is a determiner, then it's almost clear which uh, word should be the dependent of the other. Um, however, what you rarely ever read about is when the tasks aren't perfectly related uh, and good matches, they don't help each other. They actually hurt each other. And so these kind of negative results are very hard to publish uh, and hence uh, not talked about very much. And so, yeah, these are you know, all the issues, or at least some of the issues of why multitask learning is really hard, and I think sort of at that perimeter of uh, the limits of, of deep learning for NLP. And so this is a, a paper that's currently in submission uh, that basically tries to tackle that. Um, the, the title of the paper is A Joint Many Task Model, Growing a Neural Network for Multiple NLP Tasks. And the final model is actually quite uh, a monster, to be honest. Uh, it has a lot of different components. Uh, fortunately, we now know pretty much all of these components and hence we can talk about this very, you know, paper, it's not even published yet, I mean, it's an archive, uh, but you should be able to understand uh, all the components of this model now and be able to implement something very similar. So I'll go over it a little bit on a high level and then we'll zoom into the different aspects and feel free to ask any kind of question. Um, so the first thing that we'll do is we have some kind of word vector representations. Uh, there are actually some clever things in this paper about uh, n-gram vectors too, instead of just word vectors, uh, which sometimes you have these unknown words. Uh, you can go subword uh, tokens. Uh, Chris mentioned you know, character models are, are in a similar kind of idea. And then the word vectors are basically given to a series of LSTMs. All of these big blocks here are LSTMs. And the output of one LSTM is given as input to the next one, but not just the output of the softmax, but also the hidden states of the LSTMs as a standard when you stack uh, multiple LSTM uh, nodes or, or cells uh, on top of one another. So you have these short circuit connections. So the first LSTM here will just classify part of speech tags at every word. The next one will classify beginnings and ends of chunks. Uh, and then this one will do dependency uh, parsing. I'll describe uh, how to do that with a simple LSTM in a second. Uh, and then when we classify dependency parses, for instance, we still take as input these short circuit connections from part of speech tags to each of these higher level tasks. And then uh, at some point, new tasks and higher level tasks will require you to understand two sentences at once. So then we have a simple sort of pooling scheme similar to what we described with convolutional neural networks uh, where we pool over time uh, for classifying relatedness and entailment. And in the end, we can train this entire beast jointly in one objective function. All right, before I jump into details, any questions high level? Oh, great question. Why, why do we have two of them? So. Uh, this is just, uh, you can think of it, if you only have tasks that require one sentence, you can just have one. Uh, it's just if you want to classify how related is this sentence to that other sentence, we just show two, and because that's sort of the highest level we get to, we just showed it in one plot, so I have all things in there. 
So the question is, if the relationship is symmetric, wouldn't you want to use the same system for both uh, sentences? So we do use the same system for both sentences. These two here are completely identical pieces, uh, and so is this one. It's just once you put pipe them through here that you basically take into consideration where they are, but you can also pool uh, the, you can pool um, across these two different final representations to make sure they're, they're symmetric as well. All right, so I think uh, it'll become clear sort of what's going on when we zoom into the model. So again, we have these character uh, and n-grams uh, as well as standard word vectors like word to vec and that we've learned about. And uh, this first layer here is this very standard part of speech tagging LSTM. At every time step, we essentially just have a single layer LSTM and we pipe that into softmax. And then uh, what we also do is actually we'll compute a label embedding. Uh, this is essentially will allow us to take into consideration some of the uncertainty that the part of speech tagger had. Uh, the main idea, you can think of this basically as another layer that takes as output uh, the softmax, but you can also write it uh, as this kind of convex combination here where every label that you have has, is associate, has associated with it a vector. And you basically sum up all these vectors in a weighted sum here, and the weight depends on how certain the model was to have that label at that time step. So for instance, if you have three different, you have you know, over 40, but let's say you had three different part of speech tags, just adjectives, nouns, and verbs or something, uh, and uh, you know, basically each of these three will have a vector associated with it, say a 50-dimensional random vector, it's something you, you'll learn as well, and you have some probabilities, you think like with 0.9 this is a verb, and 0.05 it's an adjective or a noun, then you multiply these three numbers uh, with their respective embeddings, and that will determine the label embedding for Y. And so now those are the outputs of the POS tagging LSTM. And so to go to the next level, the chunking model will actually give as input again the word vectors directly, the hidden states from the POS LSTM, and that label embedding. These are all the inputs. And then we just plug, the, those are just concatenated, and then we plug that into another LSTM and that will again do something very similar where it has as output a hidden state softmax and then a label embedding for the chunking label. And you could in theory do this a lot. And uh, some previous similar kinds of architectures had actually thought about putting all of these into the same layer and we compare that and we find it works better if you have these three different tasks, uh, POS, chunking, and dependency parsing actually all in their own LSTM layer. Any questions about that architecture? Cool. Now, on dependency parsing, uh, it's a little more complicated because in the end we want to have a tree structure, right? And so dependency parsing turns out, uh, in many cases, used to require some kind of beam search, but here this model actually is incredibly simple. We again have a standard bilinear bidirectional LSTM. Uh, with now four inputs, the word vectors, the hidden state of the chunker, and the label embeddings for POS and chunking. So those are just four inputs at every time step. And now a bidirectional LSTM, as we defined it in class. And now basically, we'll just run a quadratic number of classifications of just saying, is this word the dependent of that word, or of that word, or of that word? We run through all of them, and then we'll just take the maximum uh, for each of them, and we just say that's the tree. Now, if you think about this a little bit, it might not even be a proper tree. Maybe none of them said I am classified as I'm the root. So they have all like the potential to classify I'm the root of the tree. Or maybe two things point to the same parent or same child and, or they create loops or anything like that. So in theory, uh, this might not even create proper trees. But in practice, surprisingly, it does in like 99% of the cases. There's a very small number of cases where this very simple feed-forward architecture does not give you a proper tree. And you can you know, use basically some very simple deterministic rule-based systems to clean up that last uh, less than 1% of non-proper trees and just delete certain edges or add uh, 
uh, certain, like the root to the tree, and then you get a proper tree. And this actually resulted in the state of the art uh, dependency parser when we submitted it, but since then, I think uh, one of Chris's uh, papers just outperformed it a little bit uh, already again. It's a never ending fun, fun race that we all work on together um, to, to work on, on pushing the state of the art uh, on these tasks. Uh, but yeah, somewhat surprising, no beam search required, just feed forward computation, and you get pretty good trees most of the time. All right, any questions around uh, the dependency parsing module? Yeah. You could do a lot more things to improve uh, and actually add a proper beam search and go through several of the scenarios and something like that. Proper CQI you can't do because you have these continuous vectors usually and not, um, and CQI also is mostly for, for constituency parsing, that's dependency parsing and so on, but you could do a lot more clever things uh, and slow it down. Surprisingly, you, you don't have to. You just, you know, all of this, this computation is parallelizable and super fast. Um, there's no extra infrastructure needed for, for any kind of tree search. All right, now uh, the, the last level is basically to train uh, multiple sentences uh, and for different tasks such as semantic relatedness. And what we do here is basically have a simple temporal max pooling. So that last hidden state uh, of this LSTM uh, is basically uh, just will produce a feature vector at every, hit, at every time step. And you will now just look at across all the feature, uh, the hidden dimensions of all the time steps, where's the largest value? And you just pick that one. So it's kind of what we call temporal max pooling. And you can then look at, again, these simple things like inner products between those features and uh, vector distances and so on, extract some features and pipe that into another softmax to classify both uh, relatedness and entailment kinds of relationships. So it looks kind of complicated, but really it uses all the components that we've carefully went through in class, uh, just in a clever new way. Now, sadly, when you just say, all right, this is my whole model, now back propagate, every time you had a softmax, we use our standard cross entry pair, and you just throw that into it, it doesn't quite work right away. There's one extra idea that you have to use, and we call this sort of successive uh, regu regularization, where basically inside each mini batch, you allow the model to first focus on different tasks, and then as you go higher, you will regularize the weights of the lower levels to not change too much, and that too much is defined by this regularization term delta here. So this is basically, uh, the, one of the novelties of how to make the training uh, more robust and actually result in the end with a final system that gets state of the art on uh, four out of the five tasks that we looked at. And so again, intuitively here, you have uh, at the end of the first mini batch where you're focused on just part of speech tagging, you have a set of weights theta that define you know, your label embeddings, your LSTM weights, and so on. And you now say when you train the next uh, higher level tasks on chunking, to not move uh, too far away from those weights that were really well tuned for part of speech tagging. And then uh, as you go higher and higher, you basically try to keep more things the same, but if the higher level task really wants to change a certain weight, it can still do it. That's right, so the question is, uh, as you train inside each mini batch, uh, or really almost like the whole epoch, you can focus first uh, on each of the different tasks, and you do that in a way that you start with the lower level tasks and then you move up through the network. That's right. So each mini batch is actually focused on a single task. So each, uh, each mini batch focuses on one task, but as you go and you finish on that, you go to the next task. That's exactly right. When you go, I, I just repeat for the, um, uh, for the microphone, when you go to the next task, you have the, the soft uh, sort of regularization or clamp uh, on, on those previous weights. 
So that's something that could actually work for various projects too. So some, some folks had the idea of using SNLI or entailment classification as a pre-training step for question answering, and those are all kinds of ideas that, that you could try um, as well. So there are, most of those, those tasks, uh, the joint training actually helps. Uh, there's a lot of complexity in, in getting all these numbers, and this whole uh, paper actually has like over 12 or 15 tables for the various ablation studies of using the successive regularization, yes or no, um, using character engrams, yes or no, versus just word vectors, uh, training various combinations of tasks together. There's a lot of, a lot of experiments uh, that, that went into this task. Uh, basically, uh, overall, these two are sort of the summary of, of the table. When you look at all the tasks separately, and they train all separately versus they're jointly trained, they basically all improve. Uh, and these, these are all tasks that have been worked on uh, quite, quite a lot, so you don't see huge improvements. Relatedness here is actually the lower the better, uh, so this is also good. Uh, and for some of the higher level tasks uh, on smaller data sets, you also get larger improvements. So in general, joint training with different tasks often helps when you have less data. It helps more when you have less data per task, right? because then you can transfer more. If you have a simple task um, that is only a binary uh, classification problem, for instance, or something like SNLI, where you have is this entailment, contradictory or neutral, and you have hundreds of thousands of examples for each of the three labels, then you can you know, probably just get away with training everything on just that data set. Uh, the more complex your output spaces, so machine translation, for instance, or, um, or the smaller your data set is, the more you benefit from trying to jointly train with different kinds of objective functions, having some unsupervised pre-training of word vectors, then maybe some semi-supervised things where you, have, you continue to train unsupervised word vectors together with some supervised tasks and so on. Um, this this uh, result here is in parentheses because uh, the part of speech tagging and chunking subsets are actually, um, sorry, the dependency uh, and chunking results are actually overlapping on the dev and test set. And so obviously chunking will help a lot in dependency parsing. You know that inside this chunk, everything should point uh, to one another in the, inside the dependency tree. And so this result is a little too optimistic. And, and so we have one that just trains on these two jointly, uh, you still have an improvement, but it's less strong. So these in parentheses numbers, uh, when you carefully look at your training and your def and your test sets, you realize there's some overlap uh, and you need to mention that and we do in the footnote. Any questions around the experiments of the data set on, of this model? Now, uh, these, are, these are just some more results of the various, uh, just a subset of the many people who have worked on all these different tasks. Uh, and sort of the comparison. And this is generally something that I would encourage you to do in all your proper projects, uh, but it's also something that you see in most good papers. You usually have two sets of tables. One table, one set of tables is about you comparing your best model to all other people's best models. And then the other subset of tables is about understanding your model better with ablations and modifications to your model and decisions that you made about your model. And so this, is, this set of tables here is basically the comparison to all the other folks who have worked on those tasks. And in many cases, it's basically the state-of-the-art model. And this is just like one of the many tables of this paper that tries to understand all the various combinations and which tasks help uh, which other tasks. All right, any questions about uh, joint many task learning? So the question is, what's the key insight uh, that made this model work? Um, to be honest, there are a bunch of them, and they all mattered a little bit. So having uh, better word representations with uh, character engrams helped just a little bit. And in the paper, you'll see how much they all helped. Uh, and then uh, having the short circuit connections helped. And we have a set of uh, a table that shows all the deltas uh, for having the short circuit connections from all of the lower level tasks, outputs, and label embeddings directly uh, to the higher level tasks. 
And then the successive regularization uh, helped a little bit um, also. So yeah, there, it's actually a sequence of, of things. There's no single insight other than, of course, having uh, this main model. So we also have a table that shows um, how much it helps uh, to have three layers for all these tasks versus a three-layer LSTM, LSTM where all the tasks are output at the same height or same depth uh, of the network. And we show that it works better if they're actually sort of each task has its own LSTM. So yeah, it, it's a combination of those. And because there's so many moving pieces, there's so many like over a dozen tables in, in the paper that show how much each helps for each of the five different tasks. No, um, many of them we invented in this paper. So they, they weren't available back then. And there, so the question is, uh, and this is something I brought up myself, right? Like, can, can you actually add some of these things to other models? And so several, so the word vectors, for instance, are an idea that you could add to all the other models. Uh, the successive regularization doesn't really make sense unless you have successive layers, which nobody had really done for more than like two tasks uh, before. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, some of the model architectures and the differences are, are, are just very novel. And then uh, you can't, you have to think of like what models would actually do this. The majority of papers published on these different tasks aren't extendable in that kind of way, right? There are, for instance, graphical models uh, where it wouldn't be obvious to just plug this vector into this other thing and something would happen. So it's hard to use these, sim these insights on, on a lot of these previous models. Or they have like convolutional operators instead of LSTMs and so you don't have a nice sort of at this time step I have this representation and things like that. But yeah, at least the word vectors and character engrams, that's a pretty general insight uh, that a lot of people could use. All right, awesome. Now, another obstacle that uh, we also discussed already briefly before is that we don't have zero-shot word predictions. And what do I mean by this? In almost all the cases, uh, the various models that we described, like the machine translation models, have uh, a softmax at the end, and you can only predict the words that you've seen at training time. And we've also already covered how to fix this with pointers, and you'll see now in, in PA4 already, that there we also have not just a pointer to a single word, but pointers to spans of words. So end, uh, beginning and end token pointers. And actually, interesting side note here, again, we, we've covered this already, uh, but you can also in, in this PA4 and, and for, for general question answering, try to predict a sequence of single words with a set of pointers like this. It actually turns out to not work as well as pointing to the beginning, learning to point to the beginning token and then the end token. That works better by like two to five percent or so, uh, depending on how you do it, uh, than pointing to a sequence of different words. Basically, you make two decisions versus having to make you know five decisions if you point to a span of five words. All right, now let's have our research highlight on neural Turing machines. Take it away, Nish. Thanks, Richard. Hi, everyone. Um, today, I'll be presenting on neural Turing machines. Um, it's a new, so I'll be covering two papers, one on the neural Turing machines itself, and then a second paper on differential neural computers, which was, both of these papers are from DeepMind. And we'll be seeing uh, the architecture proposed in the new first paper, and then the results from the second paper. The architecture modification of the second paper is only slight, and we generally just want to take the high-level idea that uh, the, these architectures have introduced. So all the, all the neural networks that we have seen in class so far excel at pattern matching. So you might have heard of DeepMind's agent that played Atari games such as Breakout with superhuman performance. And these tasks are ra relatively easy for the network because they have to make very reactive decisions. However, when it comes to uh, reasoning from knowledge, neural networks still struggle at that. Consider the problem of finding the shortest path. Now, in, in our introductory algorithm classes, any algorithm such as DFS or breadth first search usually requires us to store which nodes we have visited before. In the current architectures that we have seen so far, it's, real, it's really hard for networks to store that information. So the solution to this is having more memory. But 
you might be wor worried, like LSTMs, didn't they already have memory cells? It is a valid question, but we, this is not the right kind of memory we are looking for. So if, if, if you understand system speak, if you consider LSTM's memory cell as a cache, what we really need is random access memory or RAM. And this is where neural Turing machines come in. Um, so you can, uh, okay, um, yeah. So the con uh, you can, in, this, in this architecture diagram, uh, the controller uh, is in RNN and it decides whether to read and write from the memory cells. And we'll see how both of these operations are implemented. Um, how does reading and writing work? If you, have, if, you, if you have taken previous systems classes at Stanford, you might have realized that memory is inherently very uh, fundamentally discrete. So how do we make it differentiable? Because we need to optimize it using backpropagation. And the answer to that is uh, what our friendly method of attention mechanism, which is read and write everywhere, and, uh, but just, at, just with different extents. And we'll see how, to, how, how we go about doing that. So how does reading from memory work? Uh, if you, so we have this memory vector and we have been provided with an attention vector corresponding to it. So in this case, the first element, I'm zero indexing here, the first element of the attention vector is, uh, is blue, which means it, it, it has high value. And so we read the, second, uh, the first element from the memory vector it, itself. And it's a weighted sum. So given the attention vector, uh, the re reading would be different. Similarly, in terms of writing, uh, we have our old memory and we have a write value. We want to write everywhere, but how much do we write each value, each value in the memory by? And again, we use the attention mechanism here. So you can see that the second element is blue here. And although the write value and the memory at that locations are in opposite directions, you can see that in the new memory, uh, the vector has shrunk just because of different magnitudes and uh, because of similar magnitudes in the opposite in the opposite direction. It's a convex combination of the write value as well as the attention. So we, in both of these cases of read and write, we assume that we had a correct attention vector. And how do we actually go about getting that? The controller has a query vector, and it looks at each point in the memory and performs a dot product, and only to get which one it's most, most similar to. So in this diagram, blue indicates high similarity, and pink indicates very high dissimilarity. We perform a softmax, get the, uh, get the, uh, get the memory that's, uh, that, that has the most attention. Uh, now we have the attention from the previous step. We interpolate from that attention to finally get what part of the memory vector we should be focusing on now. Finally, uh, we can perform the shift vector. Now this is what enables us to read, and, uh, to read at different locations around that uh, focused attention and we then sharpen it to get our final attention distribution. This uh, final attention distribution is then fed into the read and write operations. I'll, we, we can now see a result. I'm not sure if the video has been incorporated. Uh, okay, well, let's see. Just note that this video is from the differential neural computers, which is a slightly new architecture compared to the neural Turing machine, but uses the overlying same principle of having an external memory bank. So in this case, our task is to infer uh, relations from a family tree. Uh, in most cases, it's a graph traversal problem as well as a storage problem. And, mo and a standard LSTM would struggle really hard at this problem, and which is where neural Turing machines really shine. Keep in mind that the memory vector is being updated as we see uh, for each one. Right. Just like to acknowledge the papers and the resources I would use. And back to Richard. Thanks a lot. All right. Now to another obstacle, and that is that we actually have multiple superfluous, if you will, word representations. So I mentioned uh, that we share word to vec uh, and GLOF kinds of pre-training vectors. And now if we train a uh, output, such as for machine translation or language modeling, we'll actually have another set of weights in the softmax, one vector for every single word that we have, right? In the output, the softmax output. Uh, now what that means is at the top here, we have uh, this large softmax that is the size of our vocabulary times the hidden dimensions of the LSTM. Uh, 
Uh, and in the input, we also have word vectors for every one, every word vector. So again, the same size v times the size of our word vectors. Now, a really cool uh, paper and result and idea that actually came from two students who took this class, uh, or 224D last year, was to tie these two vectors together. Just say they have to be the exact same vectors. So your softmax weights for every word are the exact same as your input word vectors. And you train them both jointly. You just back propagate, take the same derivatives, but now they're actually the same. It's very easy to implement if you don't have to take the derivatives yourself uh, in like TensorFlow and so on. Uh, would be a little harder otherwise. Uh, they also have some really nice theory uh, about you know, the softmax and, and uh, various sort of temperatures when, when you do this, but we're not gonna go into all those details. Uh, but basically, it's a very simple idea, and it turns out uh, to quite uh, significantly help. So here, uh, we basically have, again, this language modeling task uh, over the pen tree bank. Uh, we mentioned that this pointer sentinel idea uh, got 70.9, and then uh, these very, very large sort of 38 different LSTMs, for instance, uh, with two and a half billion parameters, I uh, get 68. Um, but this simple idea where we basically tie the word vectors together uh, with just 51 million parameters uh, can get the lowest uh, test perplexity when that paper came out. Uh, which is kind of incredible. Like the amount, again, the speed in which this perplexity has now been reduced more and more and we're better and better able to predict these next, the next word is kind of incredible. So it's a very simple idea that you can actually use every time you have an output space that includes all the words in your vocabulary as well as word vectors. You can use this idea and one, you're reducing one of the largest sets of parameters in your model. So you use less RAM, you can you know, have larger mini batches or you can train faster, use less GPU RAM and everything. Uh, and it's more statistically efficient uh, whenever you see a word in the output, it benefits also its, its input representation. So very neat idea, very simple, gives you, gives you a nice improvement. Any questions about this idea? It's one of those nice examples where everybody kind of assumes, oh, you just have a softmax and you have word vectors and nobody really thinks about it. And then sometimes people think about it and question some of the basic assumptions of the field and find a way to, to do a better job. So it's a really cool, cool result and uh, one of the, the best projects uh, from that class. Now, obstacle five is something that's very relevant to PA4. Um, so we'll spend a little bit more time on it, but basically, uh, it tackles the problem that in many cases, questions uh, that we might ask a system have uh, representations that are independent of uh, the current context or the input that we might have. So a uh, kind of fun example is like the question, may I cut you, uh, should be interpreted very differently if I'm holding a knife or whether you're standing in line, right? And so you might want to have your question be reinterpreted given the context and the input. And uh, the reason I brought up a dynamic memory network is that this is in some ways uh, a further refinement of this kind of idea. You will still have some kind of document encoder. You'll have some kind of question encoder. You'll have an answer module, but this answer module will actually predict indices uh, of, of the answers. Uh, and then you have this co-attention encoder instead of uh, this episodic memory module we've seen before. And now this co-attention encoder looks kind of complicated uh, and is a little bit complicated uh, in real life, but it not, not too badly so. So let's walk a little bit through it and uh, the paper gives you all the equations uh, and this is a reasonable model to try to implement. Again, once you have your baselines uh, implemented and bug free, you can really actually in many ways start from just this first step here, uh, similar to the pseudocode I gave you. And then several of these modules you can actually add one by one and see for each one how much it improves. And in fact, uh, Simon Kyung, who's the first author of this paper, that's exactly what he did. He, he looked at it, looked at errors, and then tried to add more co-attention and then tried to add you know, an LSTM to incorporate all the facts again from multiple time steps and things like that. So it was kind of a 
hill climbing on the architecture kind of approach. So in, on a very high level, let's say you have a question uh, Q here and you have the hidden states of an LSTM that you got and you have uh, some document or input D here and you have uh, M plus one steps here. You actually have this, these sentinels too, that's why it's plus one. Now what you can do is essentially take the inner products uh, between all these hidden states and that's how you get uh, these sort of context uh, matrices and then you can multiply uh, these again with the hidden states in these products and then you can concatenate various uh, combinations of uh, the, these products between these two uh, sets of vectors. So you have these outer products to compute these context vectors and then you concatenate them in multiple ways until you have the final state here. And now that one you'll pipe each input here, you pipe it through a bidirectional LSTM again and that will now be the question dependent interpretation of every word in your input document. So basically just a lot of inner products and outer products between the hidden states of two LSTMs such that you understand how related is this time step of this question uh, at this, you know, at this word of the question to this time step at that word at the input document. Lots of inner and outer products and then you try to agglomerate all these different facts again in this bidirectional LSTM. And now once you have uh, an output uh, a hidden state of that LSTM that will be given as input to a classifier that essentially tries to identify and classify uh, with uh, these highway networks, um, basically just neural networks with short circuit connections uh, at each location of this now question dependent input representation you classify which of these as the start token and that start token is then given as input to yet another uh, neural network that will now take the previous star token that we classified together with a potential end token across all these different vectors U here from the question dependent input representation to classify the output. And you can do that multiple times and once uh, the, they don't change the input and the, uh, the start and the end tokens are the same from the previous time step, uh, you'll basically stop. So, this, so the reason we call this dynamic here is that you do this multiple times and your first iteration might be wrong but you give that input, so the argmax here is the highest um, resulting hidden state. This could be you know, the 51st time step for instance, the word uh, at the word turbine. Uh, you give that as input to this LSTM which was then given again its output given to the input of another iteration of this uh, attempt at predicting the start and end token. Now, in a simpler world, if you, you know, let's say you want to eventually get to this model, but you know, you might implement the whole thing and you might be very uh, optimistic, just implement the whole thing and then it doesn't work. What do you do to debug? Well, you just take out all the different things and you start, you try to do the simplest thing which starts exactly at that pseudocode I had in the very beginning of the class. You just have LSTM for input, LSTM for question, and then you pipe you know, each state of the input into a neural network and you try to classify start and end token. Then you might have some outer products between them and you plug those into a straight up neural network and you classify start and end token. Then you might concatenate uh, these two outer products and just classify those to start and end token. If you eventually have that whole co-attention encoder, you can then say, all right, now I just classify independently the start and the end tokens from that representation U of the question dependent uh, encoder. Just independent, one classifier for the start token, one classifier for the end token. And then you can go on. And you know, each time it will take some time and you run some experiment, but it's, as long as you sort of incrementally improve with each step, uh, you know that you didn't introduce a bug. And so whenever it's just sort of general bug fixing, right? You want to have, uh, you want to try to identify where your bugs might be as you build a larger and larger system. And so if you start from something simple that you know works reasonably well and is bug free, then each time you add something to it and it improves the accuracy, you can be fairly certain that there's no new bug. Not always, but for the most part. And so 
this is a, you know, in the end, very complex system that puts a lot of these uh, simpler steps together. We actually, again, have uh, sort of introduced all the basic components, basically, of this. But they're, again, sort of put together in a very novel, novel way. And you already know the Stanford question answering data set, unless, of course, you're doing a project that has nothing to do with PA4. So I'll just uh, describe it a little bit briefly. Sorry for the folks who are doing PA4 and are intricately familiar with this already. So the Stanford question answering data set, it's a really great data set of 100,000 plus uh, question answer input triplets. And the way it's constructed is that for each question, uh, the answer has to be a particular span in the input. Uh, paragraph for the most part, sort of short documents, but really mostly paragraphs. So when you ask, what is uh, Donald Davis credited with? What's great also is they actually have multiple people answering the same question, uh, and, you know, because sometimes it's ambiguous. So one ground truth answer might be Davis is credited with coining the modern name packet switching and inspiring numerous packet switching networks in Europe. Another person might just say, oh, he's credited with just coining the modern name packet switching and inspiring numerous packet switching networks. Or even shorter, just coining the modern name packet switching. And we would assume that all of them are reasonably uh, correct and close enough. And if your model predicts one, uh, that, that is good enough. Great data set. Uh, now again, uh, these, whenever you put a results table in, uh, it's already deprecated. Um, actually, one thing that was really great to see, I just noticed today. Um, let's see if I can find this. Uh, is the model now, this is the squad website. Um, again, sorry to bore the folks who are working on PA4, not on the problem set. Uh, it's a really great uh, new phenomenon that I think we'll see also as we push the limits uh, of not just deep learning for NLP, but I think in general um, of, uh, of machine learning and AI. So have proper train dev test splits. Nobody sees the test set. Uh, you have to submit your code. Uh, so that makes it more reproducible in the future too if people are willing to open source their code. Uh, of course, you don't have to here. Uh, and uh, it's, I think, in general, a great way to improve the science um, of, of uh, what is mostly an engineering discipline, right? We're creating new systems. And so uh, you see here different, different systems, and now you also can see when they were submitted. So some, some groups are super active, and others kind of, this is my group, uh, submitted <laughs> four months ago. And this is when that uh, paper uh, came out and when this table happened. And so since the last four months, uh, we've worked on other things. And now uh, this is not the state of the art anymore. And there are lots of people who just this week submitted more. But at the time of submission, this was kind of this dynamic co-attention network was, uh, was the best model uh, on squad. The first one to sort of push above 80. What's also great is they actually have a human baseline. And this is something that will make sense for you too. Sometimes, and I've had several student groups also in, in their problem sets, work on a task. And then they say, oh, I look at my errors now, which is great. Always do careful error analysis, something we would definitely want to see in your report uh, and in the, in the posters. Uh, when does your model fail? What can it not capture yet? And sometimes you look at your errors and you actually say, I actually agree more with my model than with the data set. The official ground truth label is actually kind of wrong. You know, it's also just people, they were busy, they had to make money on AW, AW, AMT or something. Crowd workers, right? Maybe they weren't properly filtered and so on. Uh, and eventually you might hit uh, an upper limit of just what that data set can ever give you. And so it's good to have this kind of human baseline. Uh, here, the human baseline is uh, sort of uh, you know, 91 in terms of F1 or the exact match uh, of 82. And you know, once you push above that, really you're just fitting to the noise of that data set in some sense. And that is. Good if you're at that level, um, and it also helps to feel less bad if you have a new data set you created it yourself. It's good to know that it's okay to be at 85, because if I asked two people, they would only agree in 85% of the cases. So this inter-annotator agreement is, is pretty important uh, to consider as you're, as you're pushing your numbers sort of higher and higher. Any questions on, on squad, the dynamic contention network? Yeah. Um, 
I don't actually know all the details of how, who they asked. It may have been just the first author. Um, it's the Turkers and their inter annotator agreement. So maybe, okay, so then uh, that's the case. Then basically you can look at how often do these um, training set, no, explore. So how often do people actually agree with uh, when they write uh, their answers? So here there's perfect agreement between the humans, but here it might not be. So one might say, what did the church claim could be avoided with money? God's punishment for sin, or versus just God's punishment, or late medieval Catholic church versus just a Catholic church. So like they're different, um, sometimes different people agree differently, and it doesn't make sense for your model to try to agree more with any single human than humans between one another. How do you say its performance uh, exceeds human performance? Um, so you can try to do that by basically saying, all right, humans agree this often with other humans. Uh, you can create an output that other humans would be more likely to agree with than with one another. That's one way. Or you say, I will take five or 10 experts in the world about a certain thing. This actually becomes more important for like medical diagnoses when you want to also make those kinds of claims or just train really accurate algorithms. You can basically take a, a group of experts and you only select those where the majority of the experts agree on what the output should be. And if you then agree more often with the majority than any single doctor would agree with that majority, then you can claim superhuman accuracy. So what are the principles behind uh, sort of claiming like a novel algorithm? So I guess in some ways it's kind of out of the scope of the question because it's a legal question. Um, I think in general uh, novelty of algorithms is something that is also in, in the eyes of uh, the reader. Um, so there's not really a good scientific answer to the question. But. No, I guess, uh, I guess in general, a lot of these papers are submitted to conferences. Uh, and so uh, the question whether they're novel enough kind of often is subjective and in the eyes of the reviewer, uh, which can also not always be the right thing because two or three reviewers can also be, be wrong. But, um. So then here's a nice visualization. Again, something I would encourage you all to do for your uh, projects and uh, problem sets, uh, which is basically, in this case, trying to understand if this dynamic encoder having that extra LSTM layer on top of just predicting a single start and end token once uh, will actually help. And here we, we can kind of see it helping. So as you go through this, it's kind of hard to read, uh, but basically this is an input and then you see the outputs of the classifier uh, of this highway network and how certain it is that a certain word is a start token. So 66 and end token 66, so just a single word. Uh, as a star token versus having the star token be 84 and the end token be 94. And it actually switches uh, from the first attempt at classifying the right span uh, to the second. And in this case, we got it uh, more correct. All right, now the second to last obstacle. Uh, one thing you've noticed in a lot of things is uh, in a lot of these more complex models is that we actually use recurrent neural networks as uh, the basic building block for a lot of the different deep learning NLP systems that we have. And uh, sadly, those recurrent neural network blocks are usually quite slow. And unlike convolutional neural networks, they can't be paralyzed as easily. And so the idea here is to basically take the best uh, and paralyzable parts uh, from RNNs and convolutional neural networks respectively and try to combine them in one model, and this resulted in the quasi-recurrent neural network uh, by James uh, and Stephen and Seming and me. Uh, and this is essentially the description of this quasi-recurrent neural network. Uh, 
So in general, the very first uh, layer of an LSTM, where you just pipe something uh, through the single, single word vector, um, you might be able to parallelize. But then as soon as you actually take into consideration the previous time step HT minus 1 in your LSTM cell, you have to wait until that's computed before you can compute your new one, and so you can parallelize that. On the other hand, on a convolution, uh, convolutional neural network, you can parallelize uh, the convolution really well, because it only depends on two consecutive inputs. Uh, but then with the max pooling, you don't actually get uh, a hidden state at every time step. But for many things like sequence classification or identifying spans and things like that, we would actually like to have uh, such a uh, hidden representation at every time step. And so the idea on a high level of the QRNN is to have a parallelizable convolutional layer and then have a parallelizable element-wise uh, pooling layer that just looks independently at each feature dimension and computes these gates that we already uh, know. So in some ways, it combines the CNN that we looked at with uh, the gated and LSTM type uh, gates. And so we can write uh, this as a very, this is a very simple description, right? This is something that should look familiar to you, but instead of having uh, x, uh, ht minus 1 here, you just have xt minus 1 and xt. So you're not, you don't have to wait until you computed the previous hidden time step. You're just making these gating decisions based on two consecutive word vectors. And you have multiple layers of these, so this is just uh, first, uh, the first layer here. Uh, and you basically just have a standard neural network. It's not recurrent, just concatenating two inputs, two input vectors at a time. And you sum up uh, after that, and you have 10H or sigmoids, depending on what kind of, uh, kind of gates you have. So now this you can rewrite as a convolutional operator where you have a set of weights WZ over your input X. Just basically multiply, it's a pretty discrete uh, computation. Once you write it like this, you can also think of uh, larger filter sizes or windows. Uh, you could actually have XT minus two, XT minus one, and XT in each time step, for instance. Does this make sense as an operator? And just, just compute the gates at each time step. So the question is, you're splitting a cell and then you're parallelizing across each dimensions. Um, I don't see what's parallel about this. So, good question. So, uh, why is this parallel and why, why can we parallelize this? Let's say you have these four, uh, these five word vectors here, x1, x2, x3, x4, and x5. Uh, now, what each of these, at each time step, what you do is you basically take two as input Take these two as input, and you compute a vector such as z, right? And now you do this basically for for all these for all these pairs. You basically just move one over. Now the reason we can parallelize this uh, is uh, basically because we can concatenate a large matrix that just has x1, x2, and then x2, x3 and x3, x4, and so on. And we can basically pre-process our input in this format and then just multiply that same matrix with all of those. And hence, we can parallelize all of them. None of these computations depend on like the previous hidden state. So that's why this can be parallelized across the time dimensions by basically just smartly pre-processing the input. And then uh, the element-wise uh, gate here can also be parallelized across channels. So all of these are just element-wise multiplications of these gates and of the hidden states. And so you just multiply, you know, let's say you have 100 features, 100 of these computations over time can be done independently of one another. So H 
uh, t here for the first dimension of my feature channel can be multiplied independently of h2 of the feature channel and h3 and so on. The ith element of the feature channel is independent of all the non-i feature channels. That's right, so here, you, so you can parallelize this part across time, but this only across feature channels. So here, uh, you have you know, the ith element of HT depends only on the ith element of F, H, and Z. But now you parallelize differently, you parallelize across the feature channels, not across time. So you basically parallelize here, parallelize this, then once you have all of these, you parallelize this again, and you can parallelize this again. But you have to wait. You can't parallelize, you can't compute the third layer before you compute the first and the second. So what's, what's great uh, about this is it turns out to sometimes actually be better uh, than, than LSTM for a couple of parameters uh, and settings uh, and tasks that we ran. And it's certainly a lot faster, especially once you implement it properly with QDNN like kernels and CUDA kernels and, and really dig in. If you just kind of multiply it in Python, you might not be able to optimize uh, the architecture as well. Uh, and you won't gain, we won't get these kinds of speed ups. Uh, so depending on your batch size, uh, each of your mini batches, and depending on the, sen the sequence lengths, uh, you can get up to sort of 16x speed ups, but if you have very large batch sizes, batch sizes and very short sequences, then of course that parallelization will buy you less and you only get like a 1.4 speed up or so. Uh, when you look at how much of the computation for this kind of model is now spent on what kind of operation, what's amazing is basically for the QRN and the recurrent types of multiplications and, and, and just computation is actually very small now. The majority for this is, this is a language modeling, so we have a large vocabulary in our softmax. The majority of time here is spent uh, on the softmax classification only. And then there's a little bit of just optimization overhead, getting things onto the GPU, reading, and getting the word vectors and all that stuff. Uh, sometimes uh, they're also sort of easier to interpret because we have these now independent uh, feature dimensions. And so you can actually go into this demo, okay, can't see it. Where we, we visualize this, and this is also, this is kind of a nice to have, you don't have to do this, but if you have extra time, you already have good performance on your models, it's always nice to have some interactive plots to interact. Like if you have your question answering system figured out, you can write a little you know, JavaScript or some maybe even just command line thing type in a question and see what the answer is. Give it a new kind of input, a new kind of document, see if you can break it, how it breaks, or what the activations look like, and things like that. So here, uh, we basically had uh, a QRNN trained on sentiment analysis, and then uh, looked at the activations as it goes over a very large and very long document. So here, you can see uh, what is there to say about this movie. This movie is simply gorgeous. So, and once you hit gorgeous, you can see that a lot of the different activations for several of the neurons really strongly change in their activation. So, right at this, this location here. Simply gorgeous, a true feast for the eyes. And now, some of these uh, hidden activations uh, stay the same, no matter what other sort of content there is. So, Games set a standard for 3D role-playing games seven years ago. This movie sets a standard for future CG movies. Many of these trailers, blah, blah, blah. So this is kind of this idea that I mentioned at the very beginning about having these different gates. And now this is for sentiment. You know, nothing changes much. It just kind of talks about uh, content. But then, you know, when the movie does not disappoint, one, one, some of the neurons uh, will switch again. And then here... And there's another sort of seemingly pretty important change in this review. So it's not exactly a bad story. Ah, that doesn't sound super positive. So a lot of these neurons, uh, again, will switch around. And then at the end here, I recommend this movie to everyone. And you see, okay, several of the neurons, again, turning on very strongly. And eventually, 
classify this as a positive, um, a positive review. So those are super nice to have uh, if you can try to visualize uh, your model that way. And now, in, in the last five minutes, uh, I want to talk about a very recent paper uh, from, from Kwok Lee, also a uh, graduate uh, from Stanford, now in the Google Brain uh, team, actually a founding member of it, um, uh, working with uh, somebody else, uh, Zoff here, um, where basically they realized, and this is really a, a very good insight, uh, more and more of our time as AI researchers is spent on creating complex neural network architectures. And in some ways, if ideally, uh, it would be better if we could actually have an AI select the right architectures for what we do. And uh, you know, again, putting more A back into AI uh, and, and have less human ingenuity and human uh, architecture design. So in some ways, and this is kind of an introspective sort of end thought uh, also for the class, we've moved from something in the beginning where we said, oh, we do all this feature engineering back in the day in the field, and now look, it's, everything is much better because now we have these architectures, they're end-to-end -end trainable, and they learn all these features. But as we're now trying to improve numbers more and more and performance and create new kinds of capabilities for our deep learning NLP models, we catch ourselves designing architectures more and more, just like we used to design features anymore, right? We're humans, we want to use our intelligence in some, some positive way. And so basically, the idea here is uh, to use artificial intelligence to find the right architecture for a whole host of different kinds of problems or for a very specific problem. And, uh, Without going into too many details, uh, the main basic uh, controller that we'll have is also going to be a recurrent neural network, but the outputs of that recurrent neural network are actually architecture hyperparameters, if you will. So how many hidden layers should I have, or how big should my hidden layer should be? At each time step of the recurrent neural network, uh, it will output those kinds of features. And then whenever it outputs that, it will try to train a child network with that kind of architecture to get a certain accuracy on a single task and then feed that back. Now, it's very hard to actually, uh, like it's not, not differentiable because you make these various discrete kinds of decisions about the whole architecture. So they use reinforcement learning, which we haven't really covered in class and uh, in the last two minutes of the class, we're not gonna be able to really do it any justice. Uh, so it's just a different uh, learning uh, regime than the standard backpropagation. Uh, this is kind of if we train the CNN, what uh, these outputs would look like. You know, at one time step, it might predict the number of filters and then the uh, filter height and filter width and the stride size. How far do you skip to either the next words or in, in computer vision, how many pixels do you, do you jump over and so on. So basically, this kind of architecture selects its own architecture for a specific problem that you say is its reward. And I remember when I told you the numbers are getting better and better. This is again this data set on language modeling where just a couple months ago we were super excited to have these pointers and we got to 70 and then we're super excited because we tied the word vectors and we got to 66 uh, or 68. Uh, now uh, with this incredible uh, new idea, they actually human ingenuity is still important. They also share the embedding. So sharing word vectors and softmax outputs, it's not something that that model could have ever predicted, uh, and it's something that helps a lot. But in general, uh, they choose different kinds of cells. Instead of LSTMs, uh, they learn what kinds of cells should be used at every recurrent uh, time step, and with that, get to an amazing 62 perplexity. It's really incredible how quickly uh, these numbers have plummeted. And just when you thought uh, you had a good intuition of why LSTMs work well, um, this is basically uh, the kind of architecture that this model comes up with. And there is no more like, oh, this gate, and oh, what happens when this gate happens? Just kind of, you know, the model figured out how to, how to do it well uh, and, and did it in the end uh, incredibly well. All right, um, so basically there's still a lot of limits uh, that we need to tackle as a field. Uh, we still can't do general purpose question answering we still can't really do complex multitask learning where we might have the same architecture do machine translation and question answering and sentiment analysis and so on. They're all still very specialized architectures. 
Uh, we don't have systems that can do multimodal reasoning, so over you know, images uh, or, or speech together with logical reasoning, together with memory-based retrieval. There's still a lot of work to be done. And really, all the systems right now require us to have tons of data. But I can introduce a new word to you, like Jane hit John with an oofcha. I just made up the word oofcha. But now you can make lots of various assumptions about how heavy it could be, that it's a physical object and not a mental concept, you know, how big it would be, how heavy, and all these different logical kind of conclusions from a single example. All these systems we've looked at in this class require a ton of different uh, kinds of examples and a lot of statistical uh, patterns that we essentially need to match. All right, with that, congratulations. You've made it. Uh, good luck on the last couple of days of your project. Uh, thanks to all the TAs. Uh, thanks to Chris. It was a good time. Good luck. Thank you.